never had any interest in any form of cannibalism. What happened to you in the nine years in between that you were able to stop, that you were able to control yourself? It just wasn't an opportunity to uh, fully express what I wanted to, to do. People look at you today, 20 years later, and they still have no idea what you're about. Tell me in a sentence who you are. Hello everybody, it's Blobby back again. I hope you've all been doing well. Today I'm going to be trying something a bit new, but it's still fairly similar to my other content. We're going to be looking at some of the worst people that have unfortunately walked the earth with us. The goal of each video for this series is going to be a deep dive into a specific individual or a group of people that have done awful, horrible things in their lifetime. This first video may not be perfect, but hopefully over time I improve until I've reached a point where most videos are really good. Before I start, I should probably state what may be obvious. This video is going to be covering some very mature and dark topics, so if you're easily bothered, I have plenty of other videos you can watch. So let's just get right into it. Nathaniel Barjona was born February 15th, 1957 in Worcester, Massachusetts. His name at birth was actually David P. Brown, but in 1991, he changed it to Nathaniel Benjamin Levi Barjona. From a young age, Nathaniel would show some scary signs of what was going to come. At a young age, Nathaniel would express interest in flesh and blood, where he would pick at his scabs and suck the blood from the wound, which would lead teachers at his elementary school to call his mother and inform her about his terrifying habits that would upset teachers and students alike. In July of 1964, Nathaniel was just six years old, but even at that young age, he had lured a five-year-old neighbor into his basement, telling her that he had received a Ouija board for his birthday and it would predict the future. But after successfully getting her into the basement, he attempted to strangle her. Thankfully, her screams attracted the attention of his mother, who came to the rescue, but that wouldn't be all. Only a few years later, at the age of 12, Nathaniel would successfully lure another neighbor a six-year-old boy to a nearby hill, where he claimed to wanted a sled with him, but instead he would end up essaying the boy. A few years later, he attempted to lure two more boys that were riding their bicycles down the street to a nearby cemetery, where he had intentions to murder them, but one of the boys would grow suspicious and persuaded his friend to not follow Nathaniel. None of these situations would arise any suspicion about him, as he was able to continue his spree of doing awful things even five years later when Nathaniel would impersonate a police officer, abducting an eight-year-old boy on his way to school who he would proceed to essay and strangle. A neighbor looking out the window had seen the abduction and notified the police who would later, in a search for the boy, find a vehicle that would match the description of the abduction parked away from others in a parking lot. After calling for backup, police ordered Nathaniel out of the car where they found the boy bloodied and covered in his own bodily fluids from being assaulted, nearing the point of death. And while you may think, hey, at least he's definitely going to prison, uh, no, you thought wrong. They gave him probation, where late in that same year, before he had graduated high school, he again impersonated a police officer and abducted a nine-year-old girl, where after she began vomiting and convulsing from the assault, he drove up to a sidewalk and threw the girl out of the car. A witness who had seen the incident got Nathaniel's license plate, leading to him being arrested, but the assault never got back to his probation officer. So he was released from parole in May of 1976 for his previous abduction and essay of the eight-year-old boy. When his probation sentence was over, he even received a letter thanking him for cooperation. Only a year later, in September of 1977, Nathaniel, claiming to be an undercover FBI agent, convinced two boys coming out of the White City Cinema in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts to enter his car. He then drove the boys to a secluded area where he would handcuff and torture them. After repeatedly jumping on one of the boys' chests, he had believed that he had killed them, as he was 375 pounds at the time. Nathaniel then drove off with the other boy in his trunk, but thankfully, the boy he thought he killed would regain consciousness and manage to find help. Where shortly after Nathaniel was arrested, the other boy was found alive in his trunk. 
Nathaniel was then convicted of attempted murder and received the maximum sentence of 18 to 20 years in prison. While in prison, Nathaniel would be transferred to Bridgewater State Hospital after he had shared his fantasies of murder, dissection, and cannibalism of young children with the psychiatrist. And in March of 1984, he would change his name to, quote unquote, know what it would be like to be discriminated and persecuted as a Jew. During a later interview with Michael Stone for the TV show Most Evil, he claimed that he was Jewish and wanted his name to reflect that. Later in that same year, Superior Court Judge Walter E. Steele ruled Massachusetts had failed to prove that Nathaniel was dangerous. He was then released before moving to Great Falls, Montana. In August of 1991, just one month after being released from Bridgewater Hospital, Nathaniel would observe a seven-year-old boy sitting alone in a car outside the post office in Oxford, Massachusetts. Nathaniel, weighing 275 pounds at the time, would enter the car and sit on the boy's chest, where witnesses, along with the boy's mother, would see this event happening and run to the boy's rescue, causing Nathaniel to flee. An officer would recognize Nathaniel's description from over 15 years earlier, and then he was arrested for the attack where he initially claimed to have entered the car to get out of the rain, but would later admit that his goal was to kill the boy. But once again, for an attempted murder, he would just be sentenced for probation. Sadly, but thankfully, his next crime would be his last. In February of 1996, 10-year-old Zach Ramsey would leave his apartment at 7.34 to go to school. Following his usual route, through an alleyway near 400 block of 4th North Street, Ramsey was wearing a blue denim jacket with green sleeves, a blue football jersey with his name on the back in gold, stonewashed jeans, and high top black sneakers. A family of three who lived in the apartment in the alleyway would report seeing Ramsey there that morning and reported seeing an off-white four-door car nearly run him over. Another witness reported seeing Ramsey standing in the alleyway, seemingly waiting for somebody. And another witness who lives in the alley would report seeing Ramsey distressed with an obese adult male following a few feet behind him at 745. A witness would report seeing Nathaniel standing beside a dumpster in the alleyway at 715 while taking out the trash. He was wearing a navy blue police-like jacket. The same witness also reported seeing Ramsey enter the alleyway later and that Nathaniel was still standing beside the dumpster. Somewhere between where the alleyway cuts into 6th Street and comes out at 7th, Ramsey would disappear, never to be seen or heard of again. And despite many objections from Ramsey's mother, a judge would declare him legally dead in 2011. Following Ramsey's disappearance, Nathaniel, who was a voracious eater weighing excess of 300 pounds, would not make any significant grocery purchases for nearly a month and would begin to hold cookouts where he was reported to serve burgers, spaghetti, chili, meat pies, and casseroles to guests. Many guests during the cookouts would say that the meat had a peculiar taste to it, but Nathaniel would just say that he had gone deer hunting and he used deer meat in the dishes. Yet, Nathaniel didn't own a rifle or hunting license and he had not been deer hunting at any time. One woman who had told Nathaniel that the meat had tasted repulsive, or he would just simply say, that he had personally hunted, killed, butchered, and wrapped the meal. Police investigations would conduct years after Ramsey's disappearance and would determine that Nathaniel had access to his mother's off-white four-door Toyota Corolla the day the boy had disappeared, and his mother and brother were out of town for a funeral. It was also determined that Nathaniel wasn't working on the day that Ramsey had disappeared. While looking through Nathaniel's apartment, detectives found a list of boys' names, including previous victims, and a Zachary Ramsey followed by the word died. Furthermore, dozens of newspaper clippings would be found in Nathaniel's apartment following the Ramsey case. Former roommate of Nathaniel would describe finding clothes of a young boy in his apartment that matched those that Ramsey had worn on the day he had vanished, including some bloody gloves. Another roommate claimed that Nathaniel would spontaneously bring up the boy in conversations, Investigators would also find notebooks with seemingly arbitrary characters, but it was believed to have been coded writing. And with the help of the FBI and months of effort, the writing was decoded, where in the notebooks, Nathaniel described torturing and eating children, as well as macabre recipes involving children's body parts. Upon further investigation of his apartment, they found a meat grinder with a hair inside of it that would be tested for DNA. 
being found to have been from an African-American male, but it wasn't Ramsey. It was also tested with the bone fragments found in Nathaniel's garage, but it didn't match, nor did it match to Ramsey. When the detectives would spray Nathaniel's garage with a phosphorus chemical while investigating his involvement in the Ramsey disappearance, the word Tita would appear, which led authorities to suspect Nathaniel in the abduction of James Tetta, a Massachusetts boy who was kidnapped in August of 1973. His body being discovered a few days later, where an autopsy revealed that he would be violated and strangled. Finally, in 1999, Nathaniel would be arrested, initially for impersonating a police officer, but after the search of his home and finding, among other things, many pictures of young children being cut out of magazines and a bone identified as belonging to a young boy, Nathaniel was charged with kidnapping and essay, as well as the kidnapping and essay of three other boys and the murder of Zach Ramsey. Prosecutors then announced that they would be seeking out the death penalty for Nathaniel. Nathaniel was prosecuted for the abduction and violations of three boys, kidnapping, aggravated assault, and essay, including one of the charges that he had tortured one boy and hung him from the ceiling. During Nathaniel's trial, Zachary Ramsey's mother would be swayed by Nathaniel's defense team in order to testify for them, convincing her that his son was still alive leading jurors to not convict Nathaniel for his murder, but they were not all convinced that he wasn't an extreme child predator and dangerous sexual deviant. During the trial, 36-year-old Mary Patron would recognize him as the man who had abducted and assaulted her by acting as a police officer in 1974. Unfortunately, the statute of limitations had expired, meaning Nathaniel couldn't be charged with that crime. Police also suspected Nathaniel in the disappearance of a seven-year-old named Janice Pocket 10 months earlier. Nathaniel was finally sentenced to 130 years in prison, where he maintained his innocence up until he died. Montana authorities were unaware of Nathaniel's criminal record in Massachusetts, which is a fact cited by activists that were campaigning to force former sex offenders to register. In December of 2004, the Montana Supreme Court turned down Nathaniel's appeals and upheld his 130-year sentence. After a life of harming others and ruining lives, Nathaniel's life would finally end after being found unresponsive in his prison shell on the morning of April 13, 2008. His post-mortem found significant levels of LDL in his arteries and myocardial infraction was determined to be the cause of death. I know this video was quite dark and depressing, but hopefully you made it all the way through to the end here. Uh, and hopefully you did enjoy it. This was probably the most disturbing person that I've looked at in a while. Uh, but I really did enjoy working on this video, so I hope you guys all enjoyed watching it. Uh, I'm going to try to see you guys again soon. Pretty, like, fairly soon. I'm going to try to maybe switch it up, do a little bit more lighthearted content uh, just for the next video or so, maybe. But it all depends on the next time I upload a part in this series. So if you did enjoy this and you want to see more from me, feel free to subscribe and hit the like button. And stay safe out there, honestly, with the, the type of shit that's going on. Especially with what I saw in this video from researching this guy. Uh, it doesn't hurt to make sure everything's locked. Keep your kids safe. Keep yourself safe if you're a kid. Uh, and yeah. Hopefully I'll see you pretty soon in the next video.